Okay, today's reading is uh, going to be from Hebrews. We're going to be reading from uh, chapter 9, verses 6 through 12. Then we're going to skip to verses 23 through 28. All right, uh, 9, 6 starts now. When these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost is signif signifying that the way to the holies of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was, ye was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service per perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. And then 23 to 28. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as, is a, and, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Welcome to Ecourse Community Bible Church. Glad everybody could be here and also those that are listening in. It's our Wednesday night Bible fellowship and just now we're going to, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. We're going to be in the book of Revelation chapter 14 this evening. Chapter 14. Uh, so let's uh, bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord just now. Our gracious Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be here today, tonight. We ask your blessing on this study that we have. Help us understand the truth from this work, from this book of prophecy, that we may be able to apply these truths to our lives and bring you glory and be better witnesses for Christ. Of this we ask in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Okay. Um, the the central verse we're going to talk about, which we talked about last time. Only this time we're looking at verse number 17. Let me read it. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. So I'm not going to be going back and reviewing a lot of what is happening in this chapter, but I do want to say the title of this would be The Temple of God, and this is Lesson 2. So there is a temple of God in heaven. There, there was a temple of God on earth. And the temple on earth was, began with the tabernacle in the, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the time of the, God's deliverance of the Jews from Egypt. And so they built this tabernacle. And I, I passed out a... Uh, picture last week, I don't know if some of you kept it in your book, uh, your Bible, of the, uh, of the tabernacle. Now, you're not going to be able to see this from here, but uh, I'll describe it to you as we go along the way. I also want to say this, is that there will be a, another tabernacle constructed during the seven-year tribulation period. If you're familiar with the tribulation period, you should if you've been here for any time. There's going to be seven years of judgment that God is going to bring upon this earth. It's for the earth dwellers. What? Who's an earth dweller? 
You've got two types of people, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says. Those who are of the Lord, spiritual, heavenly, then the rest of them are earthly. Those who are of the earth, earthy. Uh, consider yourselves, what category are you in? There are a lot of people who go to church and profess to be Christians. They show up once in a while. We've said this before. we got churches that it would seem to have a punch punch back in the, in the back. They get their card, they punch it, they punch in, and then they punch out. And then they go about and they think that they've done their service to the Lord. Is that Christianity? That's not Christianity. Uh, Christianity is coming because we're compelled. Not by anybody else, but uh, our Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit. We are compelled. When we were worshiping today, and as Wayne, as you were playing that song, It Is Well With My Soul, and I stood there, and I'm, uh, my spirit was lifted. And I was so happy that God, and reading those reading and singing those words lifted my soul and my heart and uh, my eyes were watery you know I, I saw you get emotional on the uh, piano you know I'm here because my heart makes me, God is real the word of God is alive, powerful sharper than any two edged sword it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and the marrow. You're talking about the joints and the marrow within the bone. Between the discerning of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It says it's alive, what you have on your lap, what we're studying today. And so God wants us to study that book, which is his word, forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. He wants us to study, to show ourselves approved unto Him, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, so that we will not be misled by so many false prophets. More, there are more false prophets out today than have been in my lifetime. It's crazy what they're saying, and they think that they're having revelation from God. There is no revelation coming from these prophets from God. The revelation is complete. We're on it today. Uh, if you go to Revelation chapter 22, you know what God says? God says that if you add anything to this my book, you're, you will be add the plague, you will be the plagues of this book will be added to you. What does that mean? You can be going through the tribulation period. If you take away from anything, then your privilege to partake of the tree of life will be taken from you. Boy, that's serious. To take away from this book, to add to this book. But you and I need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's why we're here. And that's uh, 2 Timothy 2.15. So now we look to the Word of God. We see that there is a temple that used to be upon this earth that was in Jerusalem. And it was destroyed 70 AD by the Roman government. And it was for the Jews. And it was a ways and a means for them to come to appease the wrath of God for their sin. Not to, not to pay for it. You know, how, um, you know who uh, took our sins? Jesus Christ. If you're saved, Jesus Christ took your sins upon himself on the tree. Uh, let me give you the verse. Uh, listen, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Wherefore he is able to save us even unto the uttermost. Those that come to him by faith. Uh, and uh, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for our sins. Hebrews 7 and 25. You're making intercession for our sins right now. What's intercession? Praying for others. He's at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible tells us, for by one offering hath he perfected forever them that are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 10, 14, go back to verse 11. And here's another verse that goes along with this, because he's the Lamb of God. Jesus is. 
someone had to be offered. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 18, now where, now where remission of sins are. What's remission of sins? Like getting a, uh, an eraser and erasing your sin. Getting a solvent and, and cleansing you. And this is called uh, forgiveness. This is called atonement. This is called God's justification and regeneration takes place at salvation for the, for the life of the blood-bought, born-again believer. Where remission of sins are, there's no more offering for sin. Jesus did it all. All right, but here we see, and look at what it says in verse number 17. Uh, verse number 17. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. So not only was there a temple on earth, not only will there be a temple on earth, the Bible says, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. During the tribulation period, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. There's going to be another temple on the earth. Also, uh, Ezekiel 40 through 48 and Isaiah 60 through 66. Ezekiel 40 through 48, I'm talking about chapters, and then Isaiah 60 through 68, there's going to be a temple on the earth. Huh? Isaiah chapter, one. Isaiah chapter 60 through 66. <laughs> chapter 60 through chapter 66. All those chapters speak about a millennium. A millennium on earth in a temple where Christ is going to come down and He comes down in Revelation chapter 19. He comes down with the church Revelation 19, he comes down. He comes down with the church, the true church from heaven. At that point, we've already been raptured. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4, 16 through 18, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump, trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall be raised first. And then we who are alive and remain, talking about the church that's alive in the last days, the true believers, shall be caught up together with him in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Boy, that's a different picture, isn't it, than what we see in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, he's coming down with the, the sword of the Spirit. He's coming down with, he's going to speak forth, and, and like a sword goes through, uh, 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 cuts through, He's going to cut through the enemies that have come, uh, the 200 million, 200 million soldiers. Where do you read that? Revelation 14, we haven't gotten to it yet. 200 million soldiers are coming on Israel uh, to uh, destroy them, to finally destroy them. It, Satan wants to destroy them. That's when Christ returns. You can see that there is no comparison between catching us up and those that have died in Christ into the air with Christ, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Oh, what a wonderful thing, and there's going to be the rewards handed out then, uh, the judgment seat of Christ for Christians, decide what we get and what we don't get, if we're saved by the blood of Jesus. But in Revelation 19, it's going to be a horrible story. There's no one being caught up and then brought right back. Uh, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9, that the bride of Christ is putting on her garments, righteous garments, the bride of Christ. Who's the bride of Christ? Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 and 2. Paul says, I have espoused you, Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 and 2. To the Corinthian church, but also that is meaning the entire church. I have espoused you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. As a chaste, this is the marriage uh, ceremony that will take place. And it says in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 through 9. Okay, that's for the church. The bride, it says, for the marriage supper. And then immediately in the same breath, go on down to verse 14. Uh, we're, we've, we've been there, verses 7 through 9. Christ is coming down, uh, verse 12. Then he says he's bringing those who have wash their robes. They have the robes of righteousness in Christ. It says that. The same way it says it in 7 through 9, it says it again in verse 14. Only this time, the
those who have the righteous robes, they're coming with Christ. He's coming in verse 12. He's coming on a white horse. We're with them. And not just us, but the angels of, of God and all the hosts of heaven. And they're coming down at that time and then uh, they're going to slay the multitudes that come against um, that have come again that, that are coming against Israel, but they turn on Jesus Christ. And they've got the powerful Antichrist there and Satan is there. And uh, they, they can do all kinds of miracles, but he snuffs them out like you or I stepping on a flea. In fact, you, or not, you and I stepping on a flea would be infinitely harder than what it takes for him to snuff out Satan. Amen. And the Antichrist. There's no battle there. Not really the battle of Armageddon. We're with them, though, and the angels of heaven are with them. We read in the Old Testament that one angel slew 180 5,000 Assyrians that were coming against Israel when King Hezekiah was king. And they had, they had decimated the other kingdoms around. And now they're coming against uh, Jerusalem. And Hezekiah gets on it. The prophet comes to, he calls the prophet. And they get down on their knees and he's fasting and he's praying. And God, the living God, hears his prayer. And he then, he says, don't worry, Hezekiah, I got it. And he sends an angel. One angel. And that next morning, there's 185,000 carcasses, carcasses on, on the ground dead. That's what's going to happen in Revelation chapter, chapter 19. And only, not only are these armies that are coming against Israel, and that's the last verse of Revelation 14, if you want to go ahead of us. The last verse is that 200 million men, possibly some women too, because women are included in armies nowadays, of the eastern uh, of the armies of the east are going to be coming and marching on Israel to finally destroy Israel and God Jesus is going to stop it God the Son but they're not the only ones the angel, uh, Matthew chapter 25 the angels are going to come and they're going to gather all of those that have received the mark of the beast and, and, and determined in their heart that they would worship Antichrist as as, as God. They're going to be gathered by the angels. And they're going to bring them there. And we're, we're talking about a multitude that probably number over a billion, maybe two billion people, maybe. And the Bible says in Revelation, the last verse of 14, that blood will flow as high as the horse's bridle, which depends what kind of a horse you got. So it could be four feet high, could be five feet high, could be six feet high for 200 miles. So we're talking not just about 200 million men. We're talking about possibly up to 2 billion. And then they take the Antichrist, they take the false prophet with, with, with no struggle, and Christ places them in hell. Where does it say that? In Revelation, the last few verses of Revelation 19. And he places the, the first two in hell. He said, where do unbelievers go today? Unbelievers today go to a place in the netherworld. They go down uh, in, in the depths of the earth. It's a place called Hades, or in the Old Testament, Sheol. And uh, that's where they're held now. But for the anyone that doesn't know Christ, that's where they're held. And it's a temporary hell. There's, you can read about Hades and the hell and the suffering uh, in Luke chapter 16. It's, it's, it's the picture of the rich man who dies and goes to hell. Yeah. Uh, but then they're released in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse uh, 11 through 15, at the great white throne judgment of God. And then they are judged. And anyone who is judged at that judgment goes to hell. And because they'll, they'll you listen, people will give their greatest arg arguments. And Christ then will say, you know, uh, you fall short. And uh, then they will be cast in the lake of fire. Where is Satan at this time? He's not cast in the lake of fire. He is taken by one, I'm not going to say measly angel, because there are no measly angels, but just one regular angel, and he is bound. Where does it say that? Revelation 20, the first couple of verses. One regular angel, not Michael, not Gabriel, not any of the others, not the mighty angel or this or that or the angel of God or the angel of Christ. It's just one angel comes, he binds Satan, he puts him where? The bottomless pit 
Where do you read about the bottomless pit? Revelation chapter 9, 1, 2, and 3. The bottomless pit where fallen angels that are have, have desecrated uh, God's uh, law and rebelled against God's God, law are placed like the angels that fell in Genesis chapter 6 and they cohabitated with the daughters of men. Says that in Revelation, I mean Genesis chapter 6, yes. So we've got all of this taking uh, taking place. Huh? Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, read it. If Don't read it late at night. Make sure you have the light on. Because, because God says he's angry. Listen, God is angry at the wicked every day. And uh, that's, that's when he decides. He says, that's it. I'm going to give you 120 years. I'm going to give a man 120 years. And that's how long it was that Noah took 100 years and he, he built the ark with his sons. And it was huge. Uh, you want to go to Kentucky and see it. We've been there. Some of us may be going back to look at it, but it's mammoth. And uh, so at that time, of course, it was, God says, uh, all man's thoughts were evil continually. Can you imagine? It almost sounds what our society is evolving in today, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, everything that used to be evil now is good, and if you want to do good, if you want to be a Christian, if you want to believe in God's Ten Commandments and be, live a moral life and a holy life and according to the Word of God, then you're an evil person as far as they're concerned. And they will cast you into the jails. And if you therefore believe in Christ, because Christ is the one who brought forth the Word of God there in the New Testament, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what did he say? He shared that the scriptures are inspired of God. All of the scriptures. Was there an Adam and Eve? Jesus said there was. If he said there was an Adam and Eve, Moses said there was an Adam and Eve when he wrote, uh, 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 when God gave him the Torah, we call it the first five books of, of the Bible. And God says uh, that... Uh, you know, all that happened and the debauchery and, and, and the ark and the destroying of civilization was because God's wrath had reached its limit. And he said, that's enough. And he started over with Noah, his three sons and their three wives and his wife. Because why? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a righteous man. And so now we've come to that where we're um, right now, the, the wrath of God is just about full. Actually, this is next week's message. Uh, but this is just a little taste. When God's wrath is full, when, you, when His cup is full, then uh, that is when there's no more repentance. There's no more gospel given to this. He didn't go and... Uh, uh, you know, when Noah was there and while he was building, he and his sons, particularly him, shared probably the gospel every day. People were laughing at him. He's building this ark. Why are you building this ark? Because God told me to. And he gave them an opportunity to repent. Listen, from that time until now, from Noah's ark until now, he's given men and women the opportunity to repent. And up until towards the end of the tribulation period, we'll read it in one of the latter chapters of the book of Revelation. God says, let the evil be evil. Let the, let the righteous be righteous. Are you on the righteous side? Are you on his side? Or is the philosophy of the politically correct, the one world government which is coming, is that the side you want to be on? Because that's, those are the people that God is going to have his angels come. When the church is in heaven, we come back with Christ to join the 200 million man army and they will bring them there and of course God will bring immediate judgment upon them. All right. So we said all of that to go with uh, uh, our, our subject here, which we're talking about the temple. And the temple in the Old Testament could never take away man's sin. They offered animals, but what did they do? It covered man's sin. It covered man's sin. And I want to read just a little bit in uh, the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 10. The book of Hebrews chapter 10, you were reading earlier, uh, Greg was reading from uh, Hebrews chapter 9. But look, look at what this is. This is about the temple. 
and temple sacrifices, but they were but a shadow and a figure of Christ. And this is important for us to consider because this was no small thing and it was something that would give everyone from generation to generation an understanding of the heinous nature of sin. Oh, to take a lamb, a spotless lamb. Oh, to take a, 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 a bullock or a goat or to take a turtle dove. And that spotless turtle dove or that spotless lamb had to be taken in its blood taken out in order to appease the wrath of God for the sin of man, only to cover their sin. But it was all looking for, they were shadows, they were figures, they were patterns, they were types of Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And listen what this says. We're talking about a temple here. There's a temple in heaven too. And the book of Revelation 21 tells us no more temple in heaven. When he brings down the new Jerusalem and the heaven of heavens comes upon the earth in the eternal state after he destroys this present heavens of the earth but protects his, his saints through this. Only his saints. Because those are the only ones that are going to be in heaven for eternity are his saints. You're either a saint or what? Or you ain't. You're either a saint or you ain't. I want to be a saint. And I can't be a saint by my own strength. If I try to be good, you know, well, gee, you know, I think my good works outweigh my bad works. That's not going to get you to heaven. You're the only thing that's going to get you to heaven. I'm going to tell you two words. One, you have to be perfect. But that led all of us out. Or you have to receive Christ's perfection. That's it. And I'm going to give you a verse that I hope you've memorized. Uh, and that's uh, the one that I've given you in the past, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. He, God, made him Christ. When he was a man, when he took, when he took on flesh, he, God, made him Christ, who knew no sin. It had to be a man that had to be offered for the sins of men. The first Adam got us into this mess. The last Adam, Christ, where does it say this? 1 Corinthians 15. Where does it say what does it say? It says the last Adam, he came to take away man's sin. And then Paul the Apostle says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. What does it say? Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. But you have to call out with knowledge. You have to call out with hearing the word. That's how God said it. Because the next verse, verse 14 says, How can anyone be saved except that they hear it? And how can anybody hear it except somebody be sent? Uh, I uh, was at the, uh, a couple stores today and I was looking for my track in my pocket and I didn't have it. And I was not happy. Because I was leaving out the opportunity for someone to uh, hear the gospel. And so the, before I came here, I stopped at the Dollar Tree and I thought, I'm not going to make the same mistake. I got a couple of these in my pocket. And uh, even afterwards, Greg and John and uh, Doug and uh, Lori, I thought afterwards, did anyone give the trucker uh, a track or a, or a verbal gospel presentation, something? Okay, and I thought, you know, uh, but I carry, I, I just keep filling my car uh, little um, center uh, piece with tracks. Ones that I know. Ones that are thorough. Ones that uh, I prayed through. Ones that took, what, 50 years of uh, studying the Word of God. Uh, it's not that this is an all and in all. It's got, you know, my uh, some mistakes or whatever, but not from Scripture. Listen, get the Gospel out. How important is that? So you've got to hear the gospel. The Holy Spirit's got to bring conviction to you. And if you're not convicted, then you've got to pray, Oh God, give me that conviction. Holy Spirit, give me that conviction. Bring me, grant me repentance of my sin. Grant me repentance of my sin. This isn't coming to church or Sunday school and praying a happy little prayer and thinking, Oh my goodness, somebody says I'm saved. No, no one can tell you you're saved but Christ. And so you must have this interaction with Christ who wants to come into your heart 
And then it, you know what the evidence is? The evidence is, is God's fruit inside. Uh, a regenerated spirit. It is something that as you come to the, a church where the light is on, I'm not talking about these lights, I'm talking about the light of Revelation chapter 1, the church at Ephesus had the light on. God's light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If any man, New American Saint, no, no, New International says, follows me, fine. If any man, King James, believes in me, he should not perish, but have the light. He should not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. Okay, that light. And then we have spiritual hearing. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Not everybody's got an ear to hear. You've got to have spiritual ear canals. Spiritual in order to get the truth. All right. Uh, are you saved? There was a temple of the Old Testament. They had to do everything. It was meticulous. It was to cover sins in order that they could have fellowship with God. Today as Christians, we have our sins taken away. Where, where there's remission of sins, there's no more offering for sin. That doesn't mean we don't still sin. But it's paid for. And does that mean we have grace to sin? No. God forbid. Romans 6, 1 and 2. God's grace covers our sin. Does that mean that we should sin? No. It says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How shall we? Romans 6, 1 through 3. And um, so, how important is that? Yeah, I'm glad you're copying these verses down. Uh, but it's going to be on uh, next uh, Wednesday online, YouTube, and also on Facebook, E Course Community Bible Church. Because knowing that you're saved is the is desperate. You know, not not going to a happy church. Well, I go to an evangelical church and. You know, I've prayed that prayer. Yeah, you have to pray a prayer, but praying that prayer by itself doesn't save you. Jesus has to save you. Amen. I want to give you John, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11. Here's what God says. This is the witness. Whose witness? His witness. Can you get any better witness? This is the witness. This is the testimony that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is where? In His Son. Where's that? First uh, John chapter 5, verse 11. So wherever His Son is, is life. And He promises He'll come and live inside us. Where? The next verse. In Hebrews chapter, uh, ah, did I say Hebrews? First John 5, 11, and verse 12 says, He that has the Son has life. And he that has not the Son of God has not life. And John 3.36 goes on to say, and the wrath of God will be upon him. John 3.36. The wrath of God. You've got to believe, and if you don't believe and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, John 1.12, then the Bible says the wrath of God, we were talking about the wrath of God, abides uh, uh, upon earth dwellers. Those who don't embrace Christ. The true blood-bought born-again believer cannot experience the wrath of God. The true blood-bought born-again believer cannot in this life. My father gets upset with me sometimes. And uh, why? Because I stumble at times. I, I don't say that lightly. I, uh, if, 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 if I sin, and the Bible says if we say we have no sins, we're liars. 1 John 1.8. But it says, if we confess that sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, wash us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. And so I want to take short accounts with, with, with sin. I, I, I don't want to uh, beleaguer. I don't want to, uh, uh, if, if, if something hits me, maybe it's a thought or something that I've done and it's a sin, then by God's grace, I say by God's grace, I pray every day, God, let me walk in your spirit. Holy Spirit, let me walk in your Holy Spirit. There are evidences of being saved. Okay? So that's why we have the Ladies Bible Fellowships on, uh, on, on Fridays mornings and uh, the Men's Bible Fellowships and the Wednesday Bible Fellowship and Sunday Church and we have uh, Sunday School in the 
bulletins and we want you to read the Bible every day and go out evangelizing and so forth. There's a light on in this church. Somebody can come here and they can get saved. They can hear the Word of God. Amen. That's important. All of because why? These, this is the work of Christ. Not by works of righteousness which we've done. Not by how good that we are. But according to His mercy, He saves us by the washing. We need to be washed. And the renewing of the Holy Spirit, Titus 3, 5. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. I, when I pray, I pray, God, give me the grace to praise you every day. I want to praise you every day. I pray that in my prayers to Him. I need your grace to praise you. I want, to, I want to praise you every day in my life. But I have new spiritual DNA. I have met with the Lord Jesus. He's come into my heart and I'm so grateful. The Holy Spirit lives inside me right now. And I'm so grateful. And the Bible says He'll never leave me. In Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. How can we grieve the Holy Spirit? When we sin. And what a horrible thing to live in sin, right? There's a difference between sinning and stumbling. Yes, we sin, but when a righteous person uh, sins, he's convicted by the Holy Spirit or chastised by Heavenly Father. God chastens those whom He loves. Chastens, disciplines. I'm thankful. I'd ask you all to raise your hands. How many of you are glad that your Heavenly Father chastises you? And be careful when you raise your hands. Because next time that you decide, well, I think I'm going to do my own thing. You know, God doesn't need your permission, by the way. God chastens those whom He loves. And I'm just about done. And this is uh, Hebrew chapter 12, verse 5. And go through verse 12, of whom all are partakers if you're a child of God. If you're a child of God. You can't live in sin, friend. You live in sin. You, what, what is living in sin? That's when you decide, I'm going to live in a lifestyle. It could be fornication. It could be adultery. It could be drunkenness. It could be some of the sins that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 10. If you're living in those sins and there's no conviction and there's no chastisement, there may be no self, there, there may be no salvation. And Paul the Apostle says, examine yourselves whether you're in the faith. And then Peter says, make sure of your calling and election. Make sure you've been called. So we've said all of this, and all of this was the picture of the old covenant when you had the temple and every day blood was shed at the temple. And this was a figure and a picture for the new, uh, for, for um, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. I want to read this in close. Christ, His blood did pay, but you've got to know Him. How many people don't know Him that think that they're Christian? Multitudes. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, Hebrews 10, and not the very image of those things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Never can the offerings of a bullock or a lamb purge the sins that they've committed. For the only appease, only cover. For then they would not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have done no consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. And that's the Jewish temple. That's like the Lord's Supper, by the way. We have the, the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, in the front there it says, uh, uh, repent and be baptized. But uh, this is our communion table and it just reminds us, do this in remembrance of me. So when we partake of the Lord's Supper, then we are doing this in remembrance of Christ. That's not taking away our sins, taking uh, the, the, the wafer and the uh, uh, fruit drink that represents the body and blood of Christ. Boy, you could keep doing that all, all day. Well, I would, wouldn't you, if, the, if you knew that that had some kind of grace or power that, and I'd keep some in a, bit, a little baggie and I'd just be, you know, and there are some religions, Roman Catholic, that say that, uh, 
that this is the body and blood of Christ and that it is grace that helps you to get to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. This is in remembrance of me. Do this, and Jesus says this, do this in remembrance of me. All right. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sac this is Christ coming into the world, sacrifice and offering would he not, but a body hast thou prepared me. So, here's the Lamb of God. God the Father gave him a, a, a body that looked like us. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. When we get to heaven, God has a face like John's, like God's. <laughs> like Lori's, I mean, it's human. Because it was necessary because man, we, mankind, Adam and Eve, we sinned and needed a Redeemer. And He sent one. And I'm glad I know Him and I love Him. Wherefore, when He cometh into the world, He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me, and burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then I said, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God, Jesus says. And above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law, that merely appeased God's raw wrath. He didn't pay for their sins. Verse 9, and I'm going to read two more verses and close. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first covenant that he might establish the second. And watch this. This is great. Verse 10. By which will we are sanctified. God's will sets us apart now as his. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many times? Once. He doesn't have to be offered again and again and again. That's what uh, happens in the Mass. We don't have any Mass here. We celebrate the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Christ. But Jesus, he died once. He doesn't have to be crucified again and again and again and again and again. That's not biblical, friends. And he does this once for all. He takes away the first that he may establish the second by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And you know what? When he died and he rose again, Dr. J. Bar McGee believes that, and it seems to make sense, that he took his blood there because there's a temple in heaven and offered His blood. When we get up there, we will remember the Savior, the Lamb of God who died for us because there's a temple there. But in Revelation 21, 22, when we get into the eternal state, which is after the thousand year millennium of Revelation chapter 20, when we get into 21 and 22, we see that God says, no more temple because I am the temple. No more temple. You know what the temple is during the church age? The body of believers. That's where the temple's at. We are priests. We are royal priests, the Bible tells us. And uh, that's where the temple's at. There is no building. Nothing special about this building. A little bit nicer now that we have this here, but... Okay, maybe not. It's not. It's the presence of God. Two or three are gathered in my name. I am present. And I, 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 I will not forget that every single time that I meet on a Wednesday night or if we meet on a ladies' meeting or a men's meeting or if we meet for evangelism when we're going out, two or three are gathered together in my presence. In my name, I'm there, he says. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and help us to apply your word. And Holy Spirit, speak to us in our hearts and help us that we might that we might know for certain that we have eternal life, that we might, to as many as receive Christ, to them gave He power. It has to be power. It's got to be supernatural power. It's got to be power from above, from above only God's hand. To as many as receive Christ, to them gave you the power to become the children of God, the sons of God, even them that what? Believe on His name. Let that be true. And if anyone doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, so convict their hearts so that Oh my goodness, I need to know Jesus. Because there's an eternal hell. And there, once we walk through that door, there's no, there's no exit. And there's an eternal heaven. And we're so grateful that we can know we have eternal life 
today. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life and that you might believe on the name of the Son of God, 1, Corinthians, 1 John 5 and 13. O oh Lord, to know that we know you. What a blessing. So help us to live for you. And if anyone here or listening in doesn't know, to call out and, Holy Spirit, please bring repentance to me. And Jesus, I need to know. I need to know. I need to, I need to know you're in my heart and receive you as I repent of my sin, for I have sinned. And uh, this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.